Hello everyone, this is a brief follow-up video to my presentation and I would just like to show you a brief demonstration of the comb parallel ADCs that I've been working on during the past two years. And so let's look at the test bench. So this is the test board that uh, we ended up using. Uh, this is a chip on board package. As you can see, the chip is directly bonded on PCB. On the left side, all of these chips are the well, level shifters as the banks or the output of the FPGA banks works at uh, one and a half volts, but the core logic on the ADC and the sequencer works at 1.5. There is one ADC on uh, the left side, which is used to measure the current flowing through a shunt resistor. So I can measure the power consumption of the ADC, as well as a trim pot to tune the reference current for the chip as it does not have a bang up uh, reference. And if I go back on the back side, you can see these two connectors, which are used to connect to the FPGA board, as well as the two 14-bit DACs used to provide uh, input voltages, well, the reset and signal level voltages uh, for testing the ADC. We have some voltage decoupling, uh, some LDOs, and that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, I'll show you the FPGA board, which is, well, this is a generic board which has a Spartan 6LX150 device. Uh, and this is its back side, its connector, which connects to the, to the FPGA board, like that. Um, yeah, so the chip has 16 LVDS transmitters, each running at 250 megabits, uh, which are then terminated inside the FPGA with, well, at 16 receivers. Uh, the data is then serialized through hardware deserializers. It is then fed to two line FIFO buffers to, to buffer the, the data stream. And then the data stream is uh, transferred to this Cyprex, Cypress FX3 chip, which is a USB transceiver. So at its front end, we have the USB 3 interface. Uh, and on the back side, on its other end, there's the uh, well, it is a 24-bit uh, general purpose input-output sort of uh, interface that Cypress has. Uh, yeah, so the data is streamed to the PC through the USB 3 protocol and the SPI as well as some other controls of the FPGA are performed by UART connection through one of these headers. Okay, so what you can see on the screen behind me right now is a sine wave which is being fed to all of the ADCs uh, which are converting this sine wave continuously. And okay, you might notice that the sine wave is not synchronized with the shutter or, or the sampling clock of the ADC. And you can also see that there are some frame skippings uh, at the moment which is a limitation of our test bench uh, due to some differences between the bandwidth, the theoretical bandwidth of the, the USB 3.0 uh, protocol and uh, the real one that, that, that we see in practice. Uh, and currently they're being acquired 20,000 lines at the moment and I can also zoom in so I can take a look at each, at the value of each individual column. But perhaps what's more interesting is to plot some statistics of this sine wave fed to all the columns. So what I'm plotting right now is a histogram of all of the sampled values of the ADCs. And yeah, you might notice that, uh, yeah, this is the sine wave bathtub dis distribution. However, there are some glitches, which are in fact the ones linked to the DNL error uh, that I described during my presentation. Uh, I can also do some other type of statistics, uh, like line plot, mean of columns, variance. However, these are not very relevant with a sine wave kind of input at the moment, which is fed coming from a sine wave generator. Uh, however, we shall take a look at these a bit later. But right now, let's switch to the other screen and take a look at why this DNL issue occurred. But what I'm showing right now at the moment on the screen is two different differential nonlinearity plots, one when the correction is off and one when the correction is on. So when we have the correction turned off, uh, well, the DNL is high and you can clearly see the redundancy footprint embedded in the DNL. 
However, when we turn the correction on, uh, you might notice two effects. The first one is when the differential linearity is less than 0 0.5, or this darkened area. So that is the DNL caused by the uh, multiplication. And it is primarily induced by numerical noise, which translates into DNL. Uh, which is 0.5 and matches our predicted theoretical model. However, there's also a slight linearity glitch, which uh, leans towards one LSB, um, on, which is exhibited on every 16th code. And this was caused by a design error. And I'll show you briefly why and why, why that happened. So what's shown on the screen are two different implementations of the latches which we're using. So on the left side, we see the latch which is used in, as an LSB of the single slope counter, which allows us to implement the double data rate capability of that counter. And on the right side uh, are shown the, all of the 11 TDC latches. And well, as you might know, they're different. Uh, the one on the left side is using a self biased structure because its output needs to have a clearly defined logic level with, so as to increment the ripple carry counter stages later on, while the TDC latch on the right side does not necessarily need to do this. Uh, and in order to save power, we have implemented this different type of structure which cuts the power of, uh, of the latch, uh, even when uh, well, basically when the comparator is still in search mode and when the comparator toggles, power is applied. However, this this one is using the cell bus structure and their propagation delays between these two latches and their responses are slightly different. However, they're gated by the same comparator signal. So we end up having a slight propagation delay offset between these two latches. And this was uh, very well observed in simulations and we tried to solve and come up with some mitigation schemes. However, everything was uh, done so much in a rush uh, before the tape out. And well, it appears that one of the latches is a bit slower, like the left one, and we have not really managed to compensate uh, the right ones. So this is the reason why we see that uh, DNL error. And perhaps I can go back to one of the slides, the earlier ones, uh, which can clearly illustrate you what's going on. So the red, the main count clock is fed to the uh, the self-biased LSB latch of the MSB counter, while well, the rest of them, the rest of the clocks are fed to the other latches. And you can see if the first latch is, has a slightly longer propagation delay, that means that the delay clock uh, zero would be slightly reduced or shrinked because of the longer propagation uh, response of the LSB latch of the single slope counter. So the exhibited DNL is on every 16th code right at the interpolation point. So there could be, someone might, might ask, okay, but how are you exactly sure why uh, this DNL glitch is not caused by something else? So how are you sure that it's exactly that the problem, but not your uh, gain correction uh, circuitly? Well, there are a few other second order effects exhibited, which I can tweak and induce, well, judge by them. So if you change uh, the duty cycle of the clock, uh, you can also artificially introduce DNL errors. And by changing the duty cycle, I could clearly see that the issue comes from delay clock zero, and that is not really exhibited by, by the correction circuitry. Uh, so there you go, that's how it was. Let's move on to the next linearity tests. What's shown on the screen at the moment is the measured integral nonlinearity when the correction is off and on. And you might notice that there is, there is some INL which is expected as INL is directly uh, linked to DNL. However, these tests might have been uh, a bit pessimistic and slightly influenced by the uh, dynamic histogram test method that I, that I used to generate the plots. Uh, so I think a code boundary scan might have um, resulted in, in better INL response. However, uh, for an imaging application, this, this type of INL is, is, is probably fine. Um, if I show you the discrete time response of 
of the ADC. So uh, what's observed on the screen are two plots when the ADC has been fed with a sine wave and we're looking at the very zoomed in portion of that sine wave. So it almost looks like a, uh, like a ramp wave, although that is a sine wave. Uh, just the, the highest derivative uh, portion of the sine wave. And uh, you, you can clearly see when the correction is off, uh, here is the, the code step back. So you can see the cold redundancy and when the correction is on, uh, the missing code or the, the DNA glitches is, is, is also observed uh, observable um, in these discrete time plots. Uh, we can take a look at the DNL profile, going back to DNL. Uh, we can look at the DNL profile of one ADC group. So what I've tried to plot here is uh, the differential nonlinearity versus 128 columns of basically one ADC group. And although this plot is might not be extremely representative uh, because it's too dark and it shows the DNL glitch kind of hides the rest of the uh, numerical noise induced DNL. However, uh, I mean, even even so, we can see that the columns are uniform and their DNL is sort of matched. Uh, and that's why we have not uh, used uh, minimum sized latches uh, due, to, due to concerns related to matching of columns. But uh, when it comes to linearity, all of them are, uh, are matched. And just a few comments on the output noise of the converter. So we've um, achieved one and a half LSBs of standard deviation noise at one X gain. Uh, and there is quite a bit of decoupling uh, placed at the delay line and where the clock generation is uh, so that we try to minimize the jitter on jitter generated by, by generating the clocks uh, as well as the, the comparator has had some. Uh, undergone some optimizations. This one and a half LSBs is uh, at digital correlated double sampling mode. And some comments about the matching in between the ADC groups. So on the right side, you you can see the column fixed pattern noise for the whole array of 1024 ADCs versus the signal level. Uh, and it is 0.15% at uh, the highest measure signal level, 3,600 digital numbers. It is a little bit high-ish and slightly observable in the image as we shall, shall, shall look. But this issue was caused by a slight, uh, well, inefficiency of our kickback noise reduction scheme and basically comes from the comparator. Uh, and this is a plot of the row profile showing you uh, a mean of all of the 1024 columns for 30,000 samples. And well, as you might notice, there is there is barely any offset between, uh, between the columns. Uh, so let's switch back to the other screen. Uh, I'll change the input from a sine wave to a static DC voltage generated by the ducts. And let's have a look at the column FPN and the DC response. So what I just did was uh, that I changed two of the jumpers on the board here so I can I disconnected the sine wave which was previously generated by by this signal generator and uh, I, I disconnected the signal generator and I connected the on chip DAX uh, which generate the reset and signal levels which I can tune and uh, change independently and what if we come back here, here on the screen uh, what you can see is the the flat profile of the ADCs. Uh, they're currently running, converting. I'm not really sure if you can notice the uh, column FPN visually through the through the camera and perhaps the monitor is, is not very good. And, uh, the information is probably lost. But what I can do is maybe I can, I'll, I can zoom in and show you the ADCs converting at the moment continuously live view. And what we can also do is probably plot some some statistics. So we can analyze column FPN. Uh, and if I open the statistics window, uh, okay, I can plot a histogram of the signal, which is over here. 
Uh, it's about 1,500 digital numbers at the moment. And perhaps, okay, this is probably not very meaningful. Uh, and we can plot a live line plot of the converted lines at, at the moment of all 1,024 ADCs. Uh, well, you might notice that there is no the kind of banding or offset between the ADC groups, but maybe what's more important is to try and plot the mean of all columns. Uh, so currently what's shown on the screen is a mean of a thousand converted columns. And in order to fully characterize the system, this viewer has its own limitations. So I would switch over to MATLAB. First of all, I'll take a snapshot of the current image. I'll switch over to MATLAB and yeah, run that have a script which does the image image analysis. So what's shown right now on the screen is these 1,000 1,024 columns, the mean of these uh, 1,000 taken samples. So column FPN here is about 0.08%. And uh, when it comes to noise, uh, what I can do is, okay, I can go back here and I can try to plot a column histogram, which should hopefully provide me with the noise profile. Uh, and at the moment, the ADC is running at 0.7 times gain. It's not at 1x gain. So that's why we are in fact seeing standard deviation of 1.1 and not 1.5 or 1.6 uh, as it was before. But at 1x gain, it roughly varies between 1.5, 1 1.6, 1 1.7. Uh, that's, the, um, that's the typical values, which is uh, with the current reference voltages at 1x gain is equivalent to about 500 microvolts of input referred noise. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's the response. What we can do now is that I can try to show you the captured coefficients of the individual groups and we can try to analyze them a bit further. What I just did was that I changed one of the SPI registers on the chip, which allows me to embed the captured correction coefficient of each ADC group into four of the columns, or basically four of the most significant bit of bits of the columns. So what you observe on the screen at the moment are the correction coefficients of all the eight individual ADC groups. And if I zoom in, uh, closely, you can see uh, the, there's two columns which are much brighter than the rest, and that's because the MSB of these columns, of basically columns 62, 63, 64, and 65, right now uh, feed out data for the correction coefficient and not, not actual image data. Uh, and at the moment, I can tell that the correction coefficient has an overlap of two clock phases of this group. and you might notice that the matching between the individual groups when it when the overlap is two is is identical uh, however in order to prove you that this is the actual correction coefficient and not something stuck i can change the currents which are applied to the delay elements in the delay line through my control interface over here so what i can do is maybe i can Turn off, turn off that bias, uh, which goes to the delay lines. So basically, this mem control bias uh, from five five down to zero is a word which controls the current of the delay lines. And if I go over here to send, uh, go back, you can see that oops, something changed here. Uh, so. We'll now I've reduced the current, which means that the delay is, has increased, which results into, in this case, one extra phase that is being overlapped. So yeah, you can see them over here. And in order to 
to be able to show you the transitioning point and that this really is the co coefficient uh, what I can do is I can s try to slightly increase the current and then go back here on the screen and try to observe at some point I should be getting a flickering columns like as we see at the moment column one flickers I'll just zoom in so you, so you can see uh, this is column one uh, or sorry not column one but ADC one ADC group number one and it's flickering it's flickering because the third phase is just ever so slightly over overlapping with the rising edge of the count clock and uh, it appears to be a bit of like a meta stable uh, so you can notice that the neighboring group doesn't do that and of course this is due to matching uh, however this was expected okay you see this this column is also flickering a bit from time to time it does some flickers uh, this is called by matching between the columns. However, the matching of the correction coefficients between the individual ADC groups spans between plus minus one overlap or one number, which is within the recoverable range. So I will go back to the slides and I'll show you the last slide, which shows the correction coefficient versus temperature plots for each ADC group on the chip, so we have eight ADC groups, ADC group 0 and ADC group 7, from 0 to 7. Uh, so on the y-axis you see the measured captured or correction coefficient versus the x-axis, this is the temperature. And you can see that the matching between the columns is, is fairly, uh, fairly okay, I might say. Uh, Okay, at lower temperatures, the, the coefficient drops because the delays uh, shrink and at high temperatures, the delays uh, increase, which was expected. And each of these three curves shows individual data for, for three different chip samples. So, to summarize, the correction coefficient is measured to be within the recoverable range. And even if there is a mismatch between one ADC group and another ADC group, okay, this does lead to some different DNL response, but it is lesser than 0.5 LSBs, of course, if we exclude the, uh, the design error that, that I did uh, and, and the glitch of the 16th uh, digit. But yes, here are the correction coefficients captured. So let's have a look at the operation of the ADCs when they have input voltage provided by the pixel array. Um, now, I have this light source at the moment, which I <laughs> unfortunately just a minute ago I broke. I broke its reflector, so I cannot focus the light very, very well. Um, here is the test chip. Uh, we don't have any lenses or lens mount, so I will have to just show you the pixel response without without lenses, without uh, imaging any particular object. If we take a look at the actual array implementation, uh, so the array has 128 rows, uh, which have their color filters arranged in a line scan fashion. So we have two red, two green, two blue, two red, two green, two blue color filters placed on top. The pixel performance turned out to be very bad, which I'm not too surprised about that. Uh, that is primarily because this is a 5.6 micrometer pitch pixel, which was designed from a 2, or 2 micrometer original pixel provided by Dongbu. However, because the input range of the ADC is on the high end, meaning that it starts from 1.5 to 2.7 volts, uh, I couldn't really use uh, a standard 40 pixel, so we had to implement a PFET source follower pixel so that we can match the output range of the pixel with the ADC. And this pixel was designed during the last uh, week out, week before tape out. Uh, and it was, we, we did use a two micrometer uh, pixel from Dongbu, which we just shrink to to 5.6 without changing the transfer gate. So it has quite a bit of lag. 
because the transfer gate is miniature and also I have honestly never um, haven't really played with the timing so much so as to reduce FPN it, as, it, as you shall notice uh, I mean as you can see at the moment there is quite a bit of FPN induced and I should okay here so here I'm pointing the light to the chip uh, okay okay there's no there's no lenses uh, uh, so this you can see oops okay my screen okay um, yeah what you might notice is some column FPN which in fact is not column FPN which comes from the ADC but it comes from the Fixel and that is because currently I'm reading out one line uh, continuously without scanning all of the arrays so all of the pixel FPN translates into column FPN um, if I if I provide the DAC uniform voltage provided uh, and then this FPN is gone but basically that is the response so unfortunately the reflector of this light bulb uh, just broke so it doesn't really create a, a very good spot and yeah, proved to, to not be able to really focus very good light. At the moment, the integration time of the pixel is set to one microsecond, which is why I need such a strong light source. I basically need to put this bulb almost directly, directly on the chip to capture anything. It's, it's using one microsecond. Uh, integration time, the road time is about four and a half microseconds. However, one row cannot be read faster than eight microseconds due to the readout limitation of the USB 3 that we have and yeah this is that's the kind of response that I'm getting I can try to change the gain uh, but pixel design and array design is was not really the primary focus of my investigations as I'm primarily focused on ADC design uh, so I have not really spent a long time playing around with the timing of the pixel. Uh, with this, my demonstration is over. If you would like to learn more about that, just don't hesitate to send me an email. And I would also like to acknowledge some people who contributed to this work as well. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Martin for his great technical discussions and his contributions to this work. Uh, my academic supervisor, Basker, who provided the funding for, for me and for, for this chip and the work. Then it is also a couple of people down at the Waiba who I worked with. So that makes mainly Ricardo, with whom I had some discussions on FPGA synthesis and the actual readout of the chip. Uh, also Christiana, who designed the layout of the RAM generator as well as some some digital logic around uh, my master student uh, Joe who was working on the ESD protection and then uh, he drew the pads and these things around layout with this also my colleagues around for for great discussions in in a great environment and yeah that's pretty much it so Thank you very much and well, thank you for watching.